Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for being so brave to be here in the last presentation of the day. <laughs> um, I think it was a pretty intense day, so yeah, thanks for being here. So my name is Andrea Frittoli. Um, I am a developer advocate at IBM. Um, and in the past few years, I've worked a lot uh, with the OpenStack community. And so I'm here today to talk about the OpenStack way and the four opens. So um, just um, one uh, short step back, a bit of history. Uh, so OpenStack was born in 2010, a joint effort from Rackspace and NASA. They created OpenStack. Um, and then the, pro the project got some momentum, so it started growing. And in 2011, two years later, the OpenStack Foundation was born. Um, for a number of reasons, um, the OpenStack Foundation was meant to um, help um, manage the financial aspect and um, the mission officially anyways is to promote OpenStack uh, projects and to give them um, like shared infrastructures and toolings and uh, to, to be able to, to thrive. Um, the community kept um, getting momentum and growing, so in the graph I I have below that's, I don't know if it's visible, but it's basically the, the total number of commits in the different OpenStack projects over the years. Um, so I didn't put exact numbers because these are taken from Stack Analytics, which is um, a place where you gather statistics, but they are not official numbers. So, but the, the top bar in 2016 is um, 85,000 commits. So you can see how it was growing and uh, there's a lot of momentum. And in 2014, um, there was a governance change. So um, we used to have an incubator model where project uh, would not be called as official OpenStack project uh, unless they met a number of uh, criteria. And there was a lot of uh, pressure for projects to become OpenStack projects, official OpenStack projects, um, but there was um, a problem with that, like a vicious circle, because a lot of employees, uh, employers, uh, they did want their employees only to work on official OpenStack projects. And so it was difficult to gain the needed diversity in the projects and the needed momentum for them to actually become, uh, meet all the requirements to become official OpenStack project. Oops, sorry about that. So uh, I'm not supposed to say the big tent because that's not the official name anymore, but there it is. Uh, so uh, the community decided to change the governance and to make um, a project, uh, the requirement to be an OpenStack project to lower the bar, to make it simpler, so, uh, and then to use a tag system so that we can um, basically tag different projects based on their capabilities or their maturity level, so that then users can decide which project they want to contribute to or they want to, to use in their production environments based on uh, their maturity level. So one of the things uh, still projects have to uh, comply with now to, to be OpenStack project is to follow the OpenStack way, which is summarized um, uh, in this uh, four opens, so open source, design, uh, development, and community. So open source should be um, pretty straightforward. So the code is available. Um, it's available on git.openstack.org and it's mirrored to GitHub. If um, you're starting a project, it's easy to put it on GitHub or GitLab or any of these free services. Uh, however, if you're considering uh, joining a foundation or if you have the resources to do so, it's probably a good idea to host uh, your code in some infrastructure that you maintain so you don't have any uh, dependency to uh, a company that hosts your code that you don't have any control on. I mean, uh, you've seen the recent news. I mean, I think with GitHub, we have been lucky enough that uh, I think with Microsoft, seriously, I think it's going to be to go well, but you never know what's going to happen. So, um, and the other thing is uh, the, Apache, uh, the, the license. Uh, we have uh, Apache 2.0 license by default for OpenStack. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and we also have a, a CLA. So we both have, both have the individual CLA 
uh, the uh, corporate CLA. This is something um, I would say it's, it's very convenient to have for a project. It's a nice protection to have because um, it can be a bit complicated to figure out where having the license alone is enough. It depends on the country uh, where you get your contribution from. So in some countries, the fact that you submit a contribution to a project where you have a license, um, it's enough. Uh, in other countries, it might not be enough. Um, so in that sense, having a CLA is a protection uh, for the project owner. Um, but um, it's also kind of inhibit contribution in some cases. So we're seeing in OpenStack, a lot of contributors, they want to start uh, joining or getting near to the, to the community and they want to uh, submit the first patch and then they, um, they hit the, the wall with the signing of the, uh, the contribution license agreement, so the CLA. So that can scare people off. So you might want to uh, investigate whether you need one or you, there are alternatives like uh, the contributor certificate of origin that you can use um, instead of a CLA that are most, uh, they're more contributor friendly. Another um, thing um, which might be less, less obvious about open source is the no open core. Um, so it's part of the uh, mission of uh, OpenStack to uh, provide software which is not crippled in any way, functional or from a performance point of view. <laughs> also because um, OpenStack is a cloud management platform, so it basically drives other software. So we have storage, uh, networking, compute and other things. And we don't accept a project as part of OpenStack as long as there is no open source uh, alternative to actually run it in production. So like, let's say you write a project um, <clears throat> that drives um, a certain functionality in your cloud. If the only implementation available are, the only existing implementation available uh, for the drivers are closed source, so you, you basically cannot use, uh, you cannot have a fully open source implementation of your service. So you need to have some uh, closed source uh, uh, component in there. So that's a requirement that we, we have that them, there must be at least one open source fully functional implementation of direct dependencies of OpenStack. So um, is that enough um, to be open? Does it really mean being open source, like sharing the code? Well, um, one of the things that I look at if I'm starting to use um, a library or a project starting investigating whether I might use it in my code is what what's the roadmap? What may I expect for this project to, to happen? Is it maintained? Are people contributing to it? What's what's coming next and so forth? So what um, the way we address this in OpenStack, um, we do specifications um, as code. So um, every project defines what they're going to be working on, or they make proposals about what they're going to be working on. Um, and they propose those as patches, and then there is discussion happening, and then um, we have a clear um, release cadence, and at the beginning of uh, the release, uh, or before the release started, there is a selection of what are the proposed features that are going to be worked on during the release cycle, so that basically before, uh, with a few months in advance, we have a good view of what may be coming at the end of the, at the, end of the release. Of course, specifications are not guarantee that things are going to be actually implemented, but they are a good indication. <laughs> also, one thing interesting that we have is uh, the release note automation. Um, and this, is, um, this kind of tooling is implemented under the OpenStack namespace, but it's not OpenStack specific. Uh, really, so you can reuse it in, in, in your project if you think it's useful. Um, so the release notes, uh, we realize that if we postpone creating release notes at the end of the release cycle, they, in most cases they would be incomplete or people would not have cycles to work on them. It was really hard, getting difficult to maintain them. And it was getting a stronger and stronger requirement from users and operators to, to have good release notes. So um, we introduced a mechanism by which with every commit, if the commit is changing anything like it's touching an API or modifying your database 
uh, schema or is doing any uh, changes which is relevant from an upgrade point of view, for instance, or, or operation point of view, then um, a piece of release must be included within the commit, so that and then there is a mechanism for automatically generating the release notes uh, along with the release. We also do, okay, we have project update sessions um, that we do um, at our summits. There are videos that are recorded and then they are available so you can check a, a look at them to know what's coming, basically. The second thing I look at if I'm going to use a project is probably, well, if I want to influence its direction, can I do it? If I Can I have some influence? Can I uh, propose some changes if there are things that um, I need extra, can I add them? Sorry. So the way we address this in, uh, in OpenStack is with uh, contributors foco contributor focus events. So we have what we call the PTG, the um, contributors, uh, technical contributors gathering that we do every six months where uh, mostly developers, but also uh, users and operators, they meet and they plan for the development for the next six months. Uh, we have what we call the forum, so we have OpenStack summits, which are like vendor-centric uh, events, but along with the summits, we have what we call the forum, which is, again, uh, technical sessions between developers and users and operators to collect the feedback on uh, how the, the software is used and what are the features which are needed, most, ne most needed for the future. And also we do uh, meetings uh, or office hours um, in IRC, and everything, all the communication in IRC is recorded and we store uh, the logs of the communication and they are hosted by us so you can go and, and look them up. You can reference to any conversation during another conversation. You can just point a link and say, okay, this is what we discussed here and there and it's, everything is transparent this way. So this is just a picture from a design session. And you can see we tried not to use a microphone where possible. Everyone sits together. There's not, there is one um, moderator, but there is no, real, no really a presenter. So everyone talks to each other. And we use a tool called Heatherpad uh, to, to have like collaboration. Everyone can write on the same time. And then we take notes collaboratively. And, and those, so this is available for people that cannot be uh, physically in the room. And one of the downsides of open design is uh, scope creep. Uh, when you have a lot of people proposing what they want to, what is their use case for, your, uh, for the software, for the community to work on, you might uh, end up doing a lot of things and maybe each of them a bit slower or less integrated. Or, um, but um, over time, um, it converges. I think when we see reach a certain maturity, then uh, the requirements coming from people that is actually running your software in production become stronger. So if you have a good communication with your users, uh, you can overcome this issue. So um, the next open development, uh, we use Garrett um, for review, code review. So what I mean uh, with code, what we mean with code development is that everything related to the uh, development workflow, the development experience, should be open. So reviews are open. Uh, one thing that is important there is, like with everything open, you have to be uh, careful and uh, aware uh, that is not Garrett you're talking to, but it's people you're talking to on the other side. So I think there were a lot of nice talks about this uh, today. Um, so you have to be mindful that um, the comments you're putting there, they're going to people and you have to be, uh, uh, to try to be positive, like uh, nitpicking on things that are not worth to, they may scare off contribute contributions. Not everyone is native in the, lingu in the language you're writing into, um, so there may be misunderstanding, so we must be careful in that. Open development means that everything we do around development, so CI and QA is open, including like the configuration management part of it. So we run services for CI, we run them ourselves, but even the configuration management part of it is open and open source and it's part of the community, which means that actually we have a lot, quite a few companies that took our CI system and started running it downstream for their own internal CI and contributing back and helping us maintaining it. 
So we keep development and CI aligned. We use the same tools, and, and this is important because um, you want to provide developers to, of your community um, a system, um, a development experience which is actually always working. So if someone wants to contribute something to your project and they start, they try to use the development tools and they're not working, they're not likely to actually be very happy continuing working on the community. Uh, but because we use the same tools in CI, we um, ensure that they're always working and we are so careful about the footprint. So you don't, you don't need to have like a huge workstation to do development on, on this uh, solution. You can do it on your laptop. And uh, we take particular care in ensuring the debuggability and reproducibility um, of CI runs so that you can actually manage by yourself. Uh, if you're a developer, you have a good experience, you can submit a patch, you can look at the logs, you can check if something went wrong. And we even have systems to try and catch common issues and report automatically that something went wrong so you don't have to debug known situations. Um, yeah, because CI can get pretty complex and we run a lot of tests. <laughs> so it's just um, yeah, a couple of words more about um, QA since I was the, the PTL for the QA uh, program there for a couple of cycles. So we have a slightly different approach uh, to QA than like normal QA within a corporation. So it's a community-led QA. We provide uh, testing interface or tools and things that project normally supposed to do in terms of testing, but we don't enforce like a central test plan that everyone has to comply and test this and that thing, because actually the, the people writing the code and working in a specific area um, of the project, or a specific project, um, they know best. I mean, we have 64 projects, I think, in, in OpenStack. Well, some of them are um, like horizontal project, but still, it's a lot of them. So we provide plugins within our uh, CI um, and QA tools so that every project can own their definition of their CI jobs, the test they write, and, and so on. And finally, but last not least, um, open community. So we have open governance. Um, open governance, we have a repository where um, basically all the governance, all the rules, all the policies uh, for OpenStack are, are written. Um, we have a concept of uh, official project, as I was saying before. So if you comply with like the OpenStack way, you can be an official project and be hosted there. Um, and then every committer within um, that has every committer to one of the official project in OpenStack can be a candidate or can have a vote for like the, the technical committee, which is the committee who has over technical oversight over OpenStack project. Um, and every um, committer to a specific project can be a candidate or can elect the project technical lead, which is the person, um, the leader of the project who has technical oversight on the project, but is more like uh, uh, providing guidance to, to the project. In terms of communication, we put a lot of uh, attention about transparency, so avoiding off-the-record communication. Everything that we talk uh, about is usually uh, recorded, so if we do conversation, it's in either in IRC or in a mailing list, and the mailing list is archived and searchable. And communication should be always respectful, inclusive, and uh, decisions are based on lazy consensus so that uh, it means that things can take longer to be decided, uh, but I think it's, um, it's a compromise we have to be aware of. And this is just from a few years back in Vancouver Summit, all the different type of contributors together. Um, and when I mean contributors, we have developers, users, and operators, I said this already, so it's important to consider all type of contribution, not just code, because there are different ways to contribute to a community. It's important to recognize different kinds of contributions. And it's important to build trust um, uh, between um, developers and between uh, everyone in, in the community. So just to uh, conclude, uh, everything I talked about is about OpenStack, but it's not only for OpenStack, um, so everyone can reuse um, the ideas and a lot of the toolings, actually, and the automation that we use to, to, to build these. Um, we care a lot about transparency, 
And uh, I think I wanted to make uh, a short call to action here, um, because um, if you're working in a, in a company and contribute to an open source project, um, we've seen, I've seen a lot of frustration often um, that um, with expectations which are not correct from the employer side of point of view, that they expect people, engineers, to go in, in an open source community and just implement something. But there is much more than that. So there is, um, you, you need to build trust relationship, you need to give back to the community to do that. So, yeah, just some um, reference. Uh, the, the presentation is on GitHub, and thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea.